McDonald thought of his novels as an extension of his failed pulpit ministry. As such, they can convey to us the righteousness that righteousness is attractive. While McDonald's characters constantly remind us that nothing is as important as doing our duty in the next five minutes, his characters also show us there is nothing quite as exciting. The ability to make goodness attractive is also a dominant feature of McDonald's fantastical works. While his fairy tales take us into the dream worlds of full of strange creatures, fantastic occurrences, they are not escapist. <coughs> For they can help us view the real world and our role in it with great clarity, insight, and wonder. Not only can fairy tales be enjoyed because they are mortal, Chesterton once noted, but mortality can be enjoyed because it puts us in fairyland, in a world at once full of wonder and more. This is exactly what McDonald's stories do for us. After accompanying Mr. Vane through the mysterious landscape of Lilith, following Diamond's travels with Lady North Wind, and at the back of the North Wind, or journeying with Curdie to Gwyntus Storm and the Princess and the Curdie, we begin to see the mystery and enchantment of which the real world has been infused. We begin to feel that the world of fairy, as McDonald liked to spell it, has invaded F-A-E-R-I-E, has invaded the world of men, or as Chesterton put it when writing about MacDonald, that the fairy tale was inside the ordinary story and not the outside. His mythic vision encapsulated in his fantastical works invites us to see the world not primarily as facts, but as a wonderful story in which we are participants. Isn't this guy good? Yes, he is. <laughs> My God. Well, it's I'm not God. done. <laughs> This is what C.S. Lewis discovered in MacDonald and why it helped to nudge him away from the materialism of his atheist, atheistic worldview. Quote, the quality which has enchanted me in his imaginative works, Lewis Wrightson wrote in his anthology of the MacDonald works, turns out to be that quality of the real universe, the divine, the magical, the terrifying, the ecstatic world in which we all live, quote unquote. MacDonald himself, articulated something like this in the essay, A Sketch of Individual Development, in his book, Edition Arts, 1882. Here he suggests that our world is every bit as magical, every bit as wonderful, and every bit as enchanted as the world of fairyland. In the same work, he goes on to write movingly about what happens when the world begins to come alive around a person. He begins to feel that the stars are strange, the moon is sad, the sunrise is mighty. He will lie on the sunny bank and gaze into the blue heaven until his soul seems to float abroad and mingle with the infinite made visible. With the boundless condensed into color and shape, the rush of the water through the still twilight under the faint gleam of the exhausted west makes in his ears a melody he is almost aware that he cannot understand. And that's grandfather saying this. That's why we're here. Here, McDonald is in common ground with 19th century romantics like Wordsworth, Tennyson, <clears throat> who he also saw, who also saw the world as pervaded with spirituality. Yet McDonald goes one step further. He showed that it is the goodness which infuses our reality, our, excuse me, our world with meaningful and makes it beautiful. In contrast, both to the prosaic moralism of his grandmother which sucked all the beauty out of goodness, <laughs> as well as the subjective sentimentalism of the Romantic movement, which untethered beauty from its foundation in objective goodness. McDonald showed that beauty and objective goodness cannot be separated. It is precisely this that makes his work so, so appealing. I should have been shocked in my teens, wrote C.S. Lewis, if anyone had told me then that what I learned to love in Fantasties was goodness. <clears throat> but now I know that there is no deception. The deception is the other way around. It is that prosaic moralism which confines goodness to the region of law and duty, which never lets us feel in our face the sweet air blowing from the land of righteousness, and never reveals that elusive form which, if once seemed, seems, must inevitably be desired, but with all sensuous desire. You're a good dude. <laughs>
Yeah, uh, so if I could just... Uh, Please, there, there's, there's, <laughs> you got the floor. Um, there, um, I see McDonald as being a, a teacher in the, in the sort of classical sense, because in the classical world, they believed that you cannot pursue the good unless you see it as beautiful, and this, this comes out in Plato. So in Plato, the, the goal of a teacher is not just to um, teach somebody what's true and not merely to help them to follow what's good, but for them to see the true and the good as being beautiful. So um, it was a holistic idea of education where, where you're, you're trying to implant in the students a, um, an attraction to the good and beautiful, to help them to see, to, to see it as lovely. And I see McDonald as being a teacher in this classical sense because he, through his imaginative works, he, he, he renders goodness to be lovely. He shows us that there's nothing quite so exciting and adventurous as following Jesus and doing your duty in the next five minutes. And so he breaks down this um, antithesis we often have. Yeah, I need to, I need to be good, I need to do my duty, but, but that's disconnected with um, fully flourishing as a human being. And it's like, we let the devil have all the bright colors. Um, that's what Chesterton said. He, he, um, he wouldn't let the devil have all the, the, the bright colors. Um, he, he, he showed that good Christianity uh, competed with the uh, vividness and beauty of the passions. Um, this, this is what, what, what Chesterton um, um, was, was so inspiring for Chesterton and McDonald's spiritual vision. His, he was able to bring together goodness, truth, and, and beauty. Is this being recorded? Yeah. It needs to be. Again, quoted from my friend from the North Wind Annual 2003, this had created a dichotomy in McDonald's mind between beauty and faith, religion and loveliness. As McDonald continued to read the Bible, especially the Gospels, he came to realize that these two sides of him were not in competition. God is the God of the beautiful, religion the love of the beautiful, and heaven the home of the beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Is that McDonald? Or That's me? you. That's me. <laughs> 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 Can I have your autograph? <laughs> Sheesh. Dave, read that again. Yeah. God is the God of the beautiful. Religion, the love of the beautiful, and heaven, the home of the beautiful. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Gradually, McDonald had come to the appreciation to appreciate that his imagination and love of beauty were not separate to his relationship with Christ, but <coughs> integrally connected to it. Mm -hmm. I could go on and on, and I just mind. <laughs> I got a lot of red in here, and everything's underlined. Uh, McDonald showed that beauty and objective goodness cannot be separated. Ultimately, this was because of Christ, in whose person goodness, truth, and beauty existed in perfect unity. The interconnectedness between the trinity of goodness, truth, and beauty meant that to separate any of these three was to do violence to the others. Wow. Oh, well, why not? In this sense of beauty intimately connected with both truth and goodness that raises McDonald's novels above what we would otherwise be tedious, would be tedious Victorian moralism. It is true that because McDonald thought of his novels as an extension of his failed pulpit, that they often suffer from being heavy and didactic. However, I suggest that their true value lies not in their literary quality, but in the way that they convey to us that righteousness is attractive, that the Christian faith is not merely worthy of assent, but of love. In this way, the subject to the novels, the, excuse me, the subtext to the novels constantly reminds what I'm calling the anthropology of love. That's what you labeled the, the article's name to. Yeah. Just all over the place. 
We've, we've got some copies of it over on the table. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, don't that copy up whoever gets it. They're display copies. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying, Rob. I was almost over there. So I wanted to chime in and uh, some parallel quotes that I have. I'm a quote guy, as well as a show and tell guy. But the, these have been with me for a long, long time, and they, they chime in with your... There's a string hidden in the grass to the camera that was the world's first remote control camera. <laughs> <laughs> and he invented it. Oh. Yeah. He invented it. He invented it. Yes. Lewis Carroll. Yes. He, uh, Lewis Carroll. Yes. Um, he and grandfather met in 1859 in the doctor's office. Oh. They, they both had a stuttering disorder. George, not so much. Charles, yes. Since Charles lectured in mathematics at, at, at Oxford, he tried to seek out a solution. Uh, the doctors introduced them, they became best buddies, and then he became their family photographer for several years. And from 1862 to 63, he photographed the entire family and all the kids up to that point individually. Um, Charles gave George the manuscript to Alice. George brought it home, read it, thought it was pretty cool. He gave it to Louisa, said read it, she thought it was pretty cool. She read it to the kids, they thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> As such, they convinced Charles to, to publish Alice in Wonderland. It was initially called Alice's Adventures Underground. <laughs> um, uh, George at that time, his publisher was Macmillan, the only time that Macmillan published him that I'm aware of. Uh, the uh, uh, England's in Tiffany. And so uh, Charles took it to Macmillan, chose John Tenniel as the illustrator, mm -hmm. magic happened. George at the same time had written The Light Princess, couldn't find a publisher for it. This is in 62 also. He read it to his college students that he was tutoring, and they loved it. They said, publish it. And Hurston Blackett wouldn't do it, and Macmillan wouldn't do it. And so uh, he held on to it until 1864. The novel Adela Cathcart is a collection of his short stories that's based on bringing a young lady out of mental depression. And that was the first appearance of The Light Princess, um, and it was published by uh, Hurston Blackett which uh, was one of his publishers that published several of his novels. Charles photographed from 1856 to 1880, 24 years. He was a photographer, one of Victorian's finest. It, around, around the 1880 year, the uh, technical aspects of photography changed, the logistics, the chemicals, and Charles didn't pursue it from that then after. The last correspondence that Charles had with the family from 1859, their last correspondence was 1883. Uh, the McDonald's were in Italy, and uh, it was through a letter correspondence. Charles died in 1895, and of course, uh, grandfather died in 1905. 